Hello, this is Professor Keith Ross from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This is another in a series of lectures for my college students. This lecture is going to be for my corrections class. And what we're going to discuss in this lecture is chapter six, which are intermediate sanctions. And really, if you think about it, a sanction is a punishment. So we're talking about sentences. So anything less than a convicted offender serving his or her full incarceration sentence is probably going to be some type of intermediate sanction or intermediate sentence, intermediate punishment, meaning that they're going to serve some, but not all, or they're going to be sentenced to some other type of program as opposed to being sentenced to incarceration. So uh, this is gonna be a, a pretty short chapter, so let's get right to it, uh, slide number four. Intermediate sanctions are a range of sentencing options. Um, and again, this is really solely either on a judge or perhaps a parole board to decide. Intermediate sanctions uh, range anywhere from could be at the very least some sort of fine, some sort of monetary penalty. And the philosophical underpinning, uh, at least in a correction sense, is that of deterrence, that if someone has to pay out of their pocket, they might be deterred from uh, affecting this offense at a later date. Community service, work to repay debt to society. Uh, and with community service, there is sort of this rehabilitation uh, component that instead of serving some sort of incarceration sentence, that what they're gonna do is they're gonna do something to help the community, maybe even pick up a skill along the way and maybe get some understanding that they are members of society, therefore they need to contribute to society. Intensive super, uh, supervision probation. Now, you can be sentenced to probation. You cannot be sentenced to parole. In order to be paroled, you need to serve a part of your incarceration sentence, and then you are offered parole, uh, usually for good behavior, maybe to uh, uh, overcrowding conditions, things of that nature. But when we're talking about intensive supervision probation, these people that are offered ISP, intensive supervision probation, tend to be the greatest risk to society. And also they're probably the most in need of governmental services. More often than not, and I'm not trying to categorize, but more often than not, these people tend to be younger offenders and they tend to have committed felonies, probably more along the lines of violent felonies. So what happens is that not only do they have a probation officer, but they're offered services. They're offered anger management. They're offered drug programs. If that's what's needed, educational programs, life skills programs, things of that nature. Some intermediate sanctions, and there is a list. I'm on uh, slide number five. Uh, do me a favor, if you get a chance, check out the YouTube links that I posted for each of them. They serve to really sort of illustrate the points uh, in conjunction with this uh, lecture. And electronic monitoring. Now, this is probably something that at least everyone has at least seen a picture of or you've seen it on TV or the movies. You use a device to track an offender's whereabouts, usually like an ankle bracelet or something like that. Now, this electronic monitoring could just monitor the position of the person, or it could be programmed to give a signal as to when, let's say, the person who is being tracked has to call in to a probation officer or to some sort of service. In conjunction with electronic monitoring, especially in today's technological age, GPS or global positioning systems using using satellites and more often than not we're using military satellites for non-military purposes to track the location of the offender and as technology gets better we are better able to pinpoint a person's whereabouts utilizing GPS I mean and everyone if you have a cell phone you have a GPS tracker on your cell phone we can probably track you at least 
to a building or a residence that you're at. Some uh, GPS systems are so good, they can track you as to what room you are in. Home detention uh, mandates that uh, confines the offender to his or her home. Now, th this could be conditional. This could be 24 hour a day, or this could be a person gets to go to work. Maybe they work a nine to five job. They're allowed an hour, hour and a half to get home. Usually what the curfew is, is usually about 8, 8 p.m., 20 hundred hours. Day reporting centers. Th these are treatment facilities to which an offender must report to. And in chapter five, which we are going to talk about or have talked about, uh, usually with probation, this is one of the things that sometimes works part and parcel with it. So these day reporting centers will fill up anywhere from eight to 10 hours of a person's day and providing treatment services, uh, life skills, rehabilitation, uh, possibly uh, there might be connected to some type of drug program, some sort of therapeutic programs, educational programs, things of that nature. The last one that I'm going to talk about is shock incarceration or what's called split sentencing. Now, these shock programs are sort of boot camp style programs. These are short term incarceration alternatives followed by community service. Now, the shock programs, usually they're state run. I don't know of too many that are city uh, or county run. And they're sort of boot camp style where for six could be anywhere from six weeks to six months that a person is in this program and it acts just like boot camp where they're going to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. They're going to stand attention. They are going to have some sort of a muster where one of the correction officers or drill instructors actually checks out each and every one of the offenders, every one of the prisoners to make sure that their beds have been made. If they have foot lockers, is everything folded? And then they do everything that you've seen with boot camp. You know, there's going to be runs, there's going to be disciplinary measures. And these tend to be effective. However, there is a lot of criticism against uh, these sort of boot camp styles. And uh, there also tends to be some time, sometimes there is like liability issues. Uh, methods of ensuring compliance. Uh, dr drug testing. Drug tests can either be utilized from urine, blood, hair, sweat, or saliva. More often than not, at least in my experience, it's usually a urine examination or it's a hair examination. If we're going to be blood, there's probably going to have to be some sort of chemical warrant drawn, and that's probably because there was a refusal for urine and blood. And if you are refusing, it's probably one of the conditions of your probation and or parole, and you probably get sent back to jail. So a lot of times they don't do that. Uh, a lot of times what happens is drug users will start using drugs and then they'll you know, check on the internet to see if there's ways to fool the test, you know, drinking golden seal and stuff like that. Doesn't work, but they do try. Uh, sex offenders, Megan's Law, do me a favor, look this up and read about it. Uh, took place in New Jersey, a seven-year-old who was uh, tragically raped and murdered, and there was no sort of accountability. So what this provides for is the tracking of sex offenders. Now, what we're talking about here is that a person who has been convicted of some type of sex offense, uh, we could be talking about rape or criminal sex act in some other jurisdictions, criminal sex act is called sodomy, uh, could be sexual abuse, you know, digital insertion or foreign object insertions, things of that nature. Well, even though the person has served their full sentence, um, the issue is most people are not comfortable living next to a registered sex offender. And when I say a registered sex offender, what Megan's Law provides is that once you have served your sentence, you have to register with your, with your local jurisdictional law enforcement agency, and then they assess you. They assess you really on the charge. So at least in New York, it's a three-level or three-tiered system. 
level one, which is a low level sex offender up to level three, which is a high level sex offender. Meaning that there, if you're level three, there is a high, uh, high chance of probability that you might commit this again. So one of the things that Megan's law has enacted is this idea of tracking and you can just use the inf internet and go to the sex offender registry and you can find any registered sex offender in your neighborhood, what they were charged with. You'll probably find a picture. You'll actually find the address too. Intermediate sanctions in different states. Uh, I'm not going to really go into this too bad, and it's definitely not a testable concept for me. Uh, Kansas, the home surveillance pro, uh, program provides in-house 24-hour supervision and could be compared to a work release facility. So basically what this is, it's sort of like what they call a halfway house, where you're halfway out of jail, you're halfway home, but you're not either. So there is intense supervision, but you are allowed out. The Missouri uh, Department of Corrections has the uh, control and intervention strategy for technical parole v violators. So if you violate the conditions of your parole, instead of sent being sent directly back to prison, what will happen is you'll stay in this sort of halfway house and you're not allowed to leave for 90 days. And if you do leave and you get charged with some other offense, you go back. And lastly, Tennessee. GPS tracking of sex offenders. Now, again, we're talking about sex offenders. And one of the things that I, I like to bring up is that most people would not have too much of an issue living next to a person that was convicted for and served a sentence for murder. Most people would probably think that maybe there was an extenuating circumstance. Uh, this person has uh, paid their debt to society. However, most people don't want to live next to a registered sex offender. And also one of the things uh, about this Tennessee program is that if you are a registered sex offender, there are some rules that you have to abide by. Can't be within anywhere from 100 to 1,000 feet, depending on the jurisdiction of schools, daycare centers, things of that nature. So if there was some sort of allegation that a, a registered sex offender was very close to, let's say, a primary school or a daycare center, and they say, no, I wasn't. Well, this sort of solves that problem. We can track them in real time as to their whereabouts. This was a pretty quick chapter. Um, I hope you got something out of it. So have a great day and take care.